The ME-410 was a quick fix of the ME-210, a disaster of an aircraft that was mass-produced despite dangerous design flaws. A lengthened fuselage and new wing geometry fixed many of the issues, but the end result was already way behind the performance curve of similar aircraft at the time. The Luftwaffe assigned it to operations it either wasn't built to perform or could not perform effectively due to insufficient speed and handling capabilities. Not surprisingly, the ME-410 did not do very well overall. Based on what I've read about the aircraft, my impression is the developers did a pretty good job recreating the 410 and its idiosyncrasies. Like the historical aircraft, it is a unique combination of some sophisticated gadgetry and quirky performance capabilities. I found the 410 to be the easiest aircraft to taxi in the Luftwaffe inventory to date. Take off and landing pose no issues. Compared to its BF-110 contemporary, the G-2, the 410 is a little faster, and the fact that all bombs are carried internally means less bomb drag than the externally mounted bombs on the 110 G-2. One engine performance and stability is similar to that of the 110 and the Ju-88. It's still a good 100 kph slower than the late war Western Allied fighters, way slower than a Mosquito, and even the A-20 is faster. It can't turn fight anywhere near as well as either 110 model. The 410 actually has a slower turn capability than the JU-88C6 on paper. When turning, if you don't input lots of tail heavy trim, the nose wants to roll downward. With a combination of trim and judicious use of flaps, and these are two stage flaps like on the JU-88, you can put up a turn fight for a little while, probably beat up a P-47 or two, but even so it's no match for aircraft like the Spitfire and the Tempest. But on the plus side, it has a slightly higher dive speed limit than the 110G2, and I have pegged that 750 kph mark and well over that mark several times in testing and have yet to lose any control surfaces. And that is definitely a plus for high speed ground attack dives. The loadout options are faithful to the historical operational reality of its fast bomber and heavy fighter roles. You can choose either bomb loadout options or various gun loadouts. The Stu V5 gun sight is standard with the bomb loadouts and there are two different Revy gun sight types depending on whether you take MG 15120s or the heavier cannons. Many of the loadouts come with the option to use the DB603AA engine instead of the DB603A, but aircraft performance with a AA is actually slightly worse. The bomb options are very basic and are all carried internally, and there's no big bomb little bomb combos like on the 110. The SB1000 parachute bomb is something new to IL-2 and was the real world solution to the problem of the SC-1000 being too big to fit in the 410's bomb bay. The cannon loadouts are true to history with a focus on bomber destruction and not tank killing. The big guns are HE ammo only with no armor piercing ammo option. It's a fairly extensive menu with options to choose between the MG-17 and heavier MG-131 machine guns, two or four MG-151 20mm cannons, adding two Mark 103 30mm cannons to the basic load or taking a 50 millimeter BK-5 cannon. All the cannon loadouts come with the additional option to add four Nebelwerfer rockets and Requiem did an instructive video on how to use them and that video is linked in the description. The heavy cannons, to no one's surprise, I'm sure, rip the B-25 bombers to shreds, but it really doesn't take much to take them down even with the MG-15120s. It is fun to go into the telescopic site and snipe them from long distance with the BK-5. I did try out the high explosive ammo Mark 103 combo and BK-5 on tanks, and while it wouldn't kill T-34s or KB-1s, it did kill the BT-7 and T-70 light tanks. But as I've shown many times in the past, you can kill those with 20mm cannons. More interesting was that both the Mark 103 and BK-5 will kill a Sherman M4A2 with the HE ammo, but it won't kill the A3 model. And the Mark 103s are pretty awesome on soft targets. The rear gunner controls two 13mm MG-131s mounted in fuselage barbettes with a fairly decent looking field of fire. On paper, that should put the 410's rear guns up there with the PE-2 Series 87 with the blister turret as far as defensive capability. But the gunner actually needs to get some hits for the gun caliber to be relevant. So what can you do with the bombs? Historically, the most common loadout was one SC-500, but I suspect the go-to loadouts for multiplayer will be one SB-1000 or eight SD-70s. In-game, the SB-1000 blast radius looks similar to that of the SC-1000, and it's kind of cool because this SB-1000 type looks markedly different from a typical bomb and deploys a little drogue shoot on the way down. The bomb panel is located here and it's a fairly simple affair. This switch is either in the down position to drop singles or in the up position to drop all. Those are the only two options. 
You can see here that when you have two SC-250 bombs loaded, after you drop the first bomb, the white marker shifts to the second position. In the case of dropping eight SD-70 bombs as singles, the white marker moves down the row of four twice. If you select drop all for the two SD-250s or eight SD-70s, they all drop simultaneously because there is no bomb salvo mode timer. Low level tank busting is surprisingly easy in the 410 from what I can see so far with the 8 SD-70 bomb loadout. I haven't worked out all the details, I still need to figure out a technique to get the ones protected by trees, but my impression is it's easier than tank busting in the Focke-Wulf 190A8 with the same loadout and the fact that all the bombs are center line in the bomb bay means the task is much easier than having to offset with the SC-50 wing bombs on the BF-110 G2. Now you can come in low with the 410 and release bombs from 200 to 400 meters like you do with the 110 and take your chances with getting popped by the target area light flak. But the 410 has two new capabilities that can help you bomb accurately from higher altitudes and reduce the risk of getting hit by flak. And these are pretty fucking state of the art systems for World War II. The first is the Stuvi 5 site with a computer assisted bomb release pipper function. If you're familiar with operation of the BZA glide bombing periscope in the Arado 234, the Stuvi 5 is similar in some respects. If you're not familiar with the BZA and would like to learn it, my friend Flya 747 figured it all out and has put out a very well done tutorial video covering it in detail and there's a link to that video below. The Stu V5 is connected to a computer that calculates altitude, dive speed, nose angle, target elevation, and wind speed and translates all that information to a vertically sliding pipper that shows you the calculated bomb impact point. Most of those parameters are calculated automatically but you do have to input the target elevation and wind speed from the rear gunner position. Now Fly has already covered this next part in the BZA video, but I'll quickly cover it again. You also have to convert the wind data given in meters per second to kilometers per hour on the Stuvi wind setting. And to do that, you simply multiply the wind speed by 3.6. If it's a headwind, you would input minus if it's a tailwind plus. The Finnish Virtual Pilot Server lists the ground elevation for all their target areas. If it's not listed, you have to go into your mission editor, pull up the corresponding map, find your target area, put a little building on it, and check the elevation of that building. Wind speed is kind of the turd in the punch bowl concerning both the Stu V5 and BZA scopes. They don't have the capability to calculate a side wind like the typical level bombing site. They only calculate for a headwind or a tailwind. That means if the wind is coming from 112 degrees, for example, your attack dive needs to be facing 112 degrees or its 180 degree reciprocal of 292 degrees or the bomb will likely go to the left or right, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. When you open the bomb bay doors, this instrument panel flips to the side, giving you an even better view of the low 12 o'clock. And all that plexiglass in the lower cockpit makes for a pretty good view already. But the altimeter is on that panel, so it's a good idea to set your contact altimeter for your planned bomb drop altitude so you can hear that buzzer when you're getting close. For whatever reason, if you wait until the pipper is on the target you want to hit, your bomb will go long. And I have confirmed that repeatedly with the bomb assist offline. Actually, the bomb assist itself appears to be a little off in that regard as far as this aircraft is concerned. The more shallow the attack dive, the further back the pipper needs to be from the target when you release the bombs, while on steeper dives you can release with the pipper much closer to the target. This is something you can work out with some offline practice and I'm still working on it myself. In the Arado 234, you can come in on a low angle attack dive of 25 to 40 degrees using the BZA scope and the pipper will show up at 2K altitude and higher, allowing you to drop bombs and egress above 2K out of the range of the light flak. That is the primary advantage of these computerized sites. However, when conducting low angle attack dives in the 410 using the Stu V5, I can't get the pipper to make an appearance until around 1.5K. That's within light flak range, but it still gives you a better chance of getting off the target without getting hit than coming in at two or 300 meters altitude. The dive method that will allow you to drop bombs above 2K with a Stu V5 is dive bombing. 
Surprisingly, for a mid to late war aircraft, the 410 has dive brakes and they come in handy. You can come in at 4 or 5K altitude, line up on the target just like with the JU-87, even watch your target approach through the cockpit floor like a Stuka, and when the target passes under the bottom window, chop the throttle, extend the dive brakes, and start the dive. This puts you at a steep dive angle of approximately 60 to 80 degrees. At some point, you have to open the bomb bay and lose sight of your altimeter. So again, setting the contact altimeter for a 2K drop is a good idea. And you can release bombs when the pipper is just under the target. Your speed at bomb release should be in the neighborhood of 700 kph, and as you e-crash, you can retract the dive brakes and go full throttle out of there for 30 or 40 seconds to give you a jump on any pursuing fighters. Now being tied to that wind line to get an accurate bomb drop requires you to use some serious route planning and identify a reference point on the map that's roughly on the wind line azimuth with the target area so you can make your turn toward the target area over that reference point. And if you haven't done it before, you will find it's not so easy to get lined up on a target on an exact degree heading and it takes some practice. But maybe you don't feel like doing all that planning or the target is situated in a way that is too dangerous to come in on the wind line and you have to attack with a crosswind. In that case, you have to take into consideration the speed and angle of the crosswind and offset. I've discussed wind offsets ad nauseum in JU-88 spam bombing technique videos in the past and getting the offset right comes down to practice and experience. It is a difficult technique to master because there are so many wind, speed, and direction combinations to account for and there are no simple generic offsets solutions to account for that many variables. The autopilot function in the Arado 234 is a three-axis system controlling pitch, roll, and yaw, but in the 410, it only has one controllable axis, the yaw. Once you get lined up on the target, you can activate autopilot prior to your attack dive, and as you're coming in, you can control pitch with a stick while making small left and right corrections with the autopilot yaw mapped to a tube function switch on your sticker throttle. This eliminates any aircraft roll at bomb release that you might input with a stick, which can throw the bomb off to the left or right. It takes some practice to get used to, but it does help with bombing accuracy. So that was a very long spiel on the Stu V5, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are watching this and thinking, well, fuck that, that's way too much shit to remember. And if you play primarily in multiplayer servers like Finnish and Combat Box, where the flak doesn't really pose much of a threat, you don't really need to drop above the light flak umbrella. You can just do a single pass, drop bombs for two, 300 meters, and you'll be fine 99% of the time. However, if you're playing the Tactical Air War server, and it is coming back, complete with the infamous Terminator AAA using the Stu V5 to drop from 1.5 to 2K plus is a must if you don't have the resources to duke it out with the flat guns. I really like this aircraft because the developers did not make it better than it was historically. I see some people say, man, the 410 sucks, but in some ways it's supposed to suck. This aircraft is awesome because many of the historically documented flaws were included in the overall package. It is what it is, warts and all. As long as you don't push it too hard, the 410 is a pleasure to fly. It's smooth like a cat 
Cadillac Eldorado. It doesn't feel like a 110 or a JU-88, but it just doesn't perform very well under the rigors of air-to-air -air combat. You don't take a Cadillac to the track to race a Ferrari. For strictly ground attack, however, it's not too shabby and unique in a few ways. I wouldn't use it much in multiplayer unless A, the enemy fighter threat is minimal, and B, AAA is active in the target area and I don't have the resources to eliminate that AAA, necessitating a single pass attack from a higher altitude. Now the giant fucking elephant in the room is that the 410 has all these extensive loadouts to take on swarms of B-17s and B-24s which aren't present in the game. And I know it's a touchy topic, but all I can say is the addition of a heavy bomber element, even if it's AI only, will add a critical dimension to the Western Front and significantly expand the range of new possibilities for the single and multiplayer experience. It would also increase the relevance of these dedicated bomber destroyer gun loadouts on the 410 and other aircraft like the Focke-Wulf 190 A6 and A8, as the current situation is kind of analogous to buying an awesome Leatherman multifunction tool, but you mostly use the tools on this side and then you don't have much reason to use the shit on this side. I would love to fly the 410 in a single player career campaign. And the one I'd really like to see on the Normandy map is a nighttime intruder campaign, which is one role where the 410 was moderately successful, intercepting RAF bombers and bombing airfields in Southern England. I think the AI B-25 would be an adequate stand-in for the twin-engine Wellington bomber. Thanks for watching. This is HPB. Peace out.